thank you for joining us today um, at the Digital Art Fair Asia edition for this panel on new media art, human bodies, and social cybernetics. My name is Ashley Wong. I'm Artistic Director of Meta Objects, a studio facilitating digital production with artists and institutions. I'm also a scholar and lecturer um, in various universities in Hong Kong on art and technology. And I'm delighted to be moderating this panel uh, of leading artists and scholars, including Jeffrey Shaw, Henry Chu, and Dikai. Uh, before we get started, I would like to give a brief introduction to the topic of today's panel, exploring the interrelationships uh, between humans and machines and its social implications. Art has always evolved with the advent of new technologies, from mechanical reproduction from print media of wet etchings and woodcuts, through to kinetic art and light art, then to photography, film, and video, and then to computing uh, technologies and network media, robotics and AI, AR, VR, and biotechnology. However, contemporary technologies challenge traditional conceptions of art as material objects, and rather introduces a focus on art as processes and interactions. Cybernetics particularly pays less attention to the distinctions between humans and machines, but rather looks at systems as feedback loops of information where technologies provide self-reflection for humans in ways that can also change the way we think and behave in relation to each other and the environment. According to art historian Edward Shankin, the focus of inquiry becomes the dynamic and contingent processes by which the transfer of information amongst machines and or humans alters behavior at the systems level. Artworks become more about how we participate in these systems, in the interaction between artists, artworks, and audiences, as temporalized experiences unfolding in time, which evades the concept of art as fixed material objects that can easily be bought and sold. Writer and art critic Jack Burnham in his 1968 art form essay on systems aesthetic states, a systems viewpoint is focused on the creation of stable, ongoing relationships between organic and non-organic systems. Art does not reside in the material entities, but in relations between people and between people and the components of their environment. As such, art is closely connected with its influences in society. With this perspective, we look at the work of the speakers in this panel, where art is viewed as a social, as a dynamic social and technical processes open to a constant evolution and change. Uh, art in this respect is, becomes a relational process converging with avant-garde practices of conceptual and performance art. For instance, one can consider the work of Fluxus artist Namjoon Paik. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Jeffrey Shaw, who will be able to shed more light on the historical context of art and technology. So to introduce Jeffrey, uh, Professor Shaw has been a leading figure in new media art since the 1960s. He has been a pioneer in the creative use of digital media technologies in the fields of expanded cinema, virtual and augmented reality, immersive visualization environments, digital cultural heritage, and interactive narrative. Professor Shaw was the founding director of ZKM Institute for Visual Media in Karlsruhe, Germany and more recently, the Dean of School of Creative Media at City University of Hong Kong, where I also completed my PhD. He is currently Chair Professor of the Academy of Visual Arts at Hong Kong Baptist University. So he, here we have Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, look, I realized that almost the, well, at least 50% of the screen real estate is hidden by our bodies. I don't mind to uh, move my... <laughs> Um, I can move to here, that will give you 20% more real estate. But can I ask you a big favor? Take the, yes. Take the chair too. I think for us, for, for us too, it's okay. You can just be in the corner. Okay. Okay, stop. Okay, great. Okay, let me just see if I can share screen. Yeah. 
Okay, this looks promising. Right. Most of it's there, isn't it? Most of it. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some, some trajectories in new media art, but I'm specific, given the title of the, this event today, I decided to focus on my own art practice where uh, that involves the engagement of the viewer's body. And I'm going to go right back in time to um, somewhere in the 60s, it says 1967 down here. And this was a moment in history when, uh, as an artist, I was thinking that uh, instead of making painting or sculpture that you just look at as objects, uh, wouldn't it be more interesting to make uh, sculptural uh, expressions which allow people to physically interact with these um, artworks. So these are big inflatable tubes that you can just uh, jump around in. And actually, it's very much connected to, uh, you could say, to there's some elements of performance. But this poster on the left, which comes also from late 60s, from one of my works at that time, makes quite clear that this is nothing. This is no thing. I'm not making things. What I'm making as an artist are situations of opportunity, opportunity on behalf of the viewer, of the visitor, giving them an opportunity to have experiences. And this work from 1968, I would say, is a sculpture. But look, it's a sculpture that's almost invisible. It's a sculpture you get inside of. It's a sculpture which you have to perform. And it's a sculpture which is, uh, so the sculpture is fundamentally the experience, right? And the spectacle of the sculpture is the spectacle of seeing somebody using it, seeing somebody interacting with it. Now I'm going to jump forward to the late, um, to 1989, 1990. Uh, my first computer graphic um, interactive artwork with a bicycle where you can bicycle in a virtual city. The virtual cities are constituted by text so that as you go bicycling, you mention a book uh, with stories to tell, but the stories are distributed in this uh, virtual landscape. And I'm actually using of um, Manhattan and also of Karlsruhe. And these strategies of engaging the body, the viewer's body, also is uh, visible in this work, which is a work related to some uh, intangible cultural heritage projects to do with Chinese martial arts. And here, basically, the viewer is pose matching with the uh, um, Chinese uh, martial arts master. In the process of engaging uh, the viewer, uh, there is a lot to do with innovating the interface. Now the interface can be very simple. Here it's just a uh, MTR handle. When you pull the hand, these figures will fall. And when you release the handle, the figures rise up. So your engagement with the work is just simply this. A later uh, embodiment of the same work uses a, a pad on the floor. So you use your body weight to cause those people to fall. So when you stand on the mat, they will fall. These are some earlier works, again, which involve the engagement of the viewer's body, simply rotating a monitor uh, and uh, thereby controlling uh, the, um, 
is the sequence of imagery on the mo on the monitor. And this another installation that cause your rotation leaning forward, you travel forwards in the virtual world, or leaning back, you travel backwards. So basically, it's just the, the gesture of your body. Why is that frozen? Running here, frozen there. Let's just see. Something is something has gone wrong here on Zoom. Let's go back. So what do you think is happening? Is it because that's the Zoom feed, isn't it? Sorry about that, but actually this should be going out to Zoom and we're looking at the Zoom window now. But I must say it's a slightly unhappy situation on this screen. You can't do better than that. You can't do better. Okay. All right, we just have to see how far we get. Um, but I don't know if you could recognize it, but here you have a platform. And again, by handling the interface, you rotate the platform and you are moving a projected image in a full 360 degree projection environment. This is another um, apparatus that allows you, it's a, you're basically handling this, um, this device and by rotating the device, you rotate your point of view inside the virtual scenery. I think we've got about two frames per second here. <laughs> okay, so hopefully, um, Okay, this is another um, apparatus, but again, these are all uh, machines that enable, um, let's say, embodied engagement with the image and with the experience of the image, because here you have a, a robotic arm, which is able to move a projector, and the movement of the projector is connected to a sensor on your head. So as you look around, the projector is following where you are looking. Now let's see if this is going to come up on the screen. Well, I think hopefully you get a rough idea of what's going on here. As, as I'm moving around, the projectors are following my point of view. And I'm able to basically explore the virtual projected image. Okay. So the next topic I want to address is embodying the image space. Um, so I just have to wait for it to, ha to arrive. Okay, so this was a work that I made in 1997. Uh, it involves projection on three walls and on the floor, and it's in 3D. So you're actually wearing glasses. So you're seeing an image that stretches from where you are standing to infinity in all directions. And you, you see there is a wooden puppet uh, in the middle and hopefully you'll get some impression of how it works after I switch to video. But basically you can play with the puppet. So actually you, you as, a, as a body yeah, are playing with a surrogate body, which is this wooden uh, life-size puppet. And the way you handle this puppet will control the, what is happening on the screens. Because the puppet has sensors in all its joints, in the head, in the body. So as you play with the puppet, 
you are basically modulating the transformation of the image space. But again, I have to apologize because you're only seeing um, very little of it. Is this an internet problem, is it? Okay, it doesn't matter. We'll just keep going and do the best we can. Um, because most of what I want to show you is video, so uh, we have to accept the uh, consequences. So this is uh, uh, augmented, augmented reality work. Here, you're actually holding a... Um, it's an augmented reality work from 1994. You're holding a screen, and on the screen you see a virtual golden calf standing on top of... Uh, I'll try, run it again. You're seeing a virtual golden calf on top of a pedestal. And as you move around, you, um, you can see it from different points of view. And this is a... This is a more recent uh, version of this work uh, here, just using an iPad to view this virtual golden path. Except here there is another layer of, uh, of mixed reality because the pedestal has video cameras and you can see your own reflection on the skin of the virtual golden path. So once again, um, looking, thinking back when you saw that inflatable uh, um, balloon, where I, I was saying that the artwork is constituted by the performance of the artwork. So the artwork's existence uh, is in its performance. And this work also only really has shape and form when you are seeing people exploring it. So the proper documentation of this work are these images. This is another work that uh, involves uh, augmented reality. It's a work done in relation to the Dunhuang Caves. And here, what I want to try and explain to you is that as this person is using this iPad to look around in the space, they are actually exploring the Dunhuang Cave one to one scale. But what I hope will emerge from this uh, video that's running at such slow frame rate is this. Just a moment. And that is the enormously impactful social, in, uh, social, let's say, outcome of this, um, of this setup. Simply uh, an iPad which you can move around immediately attracts many, many people to gather around, also attracts people to talk to each other. And this level of socialization that this artwork generates actually is, I think, quite unusual. If we think about how people stand in front of paintings in, in a normal museum, you do not see this. And here someone is using another iPad to film that iPad. Okay, um, I'd like to show you a recent work. Got 10 minutes, huh? I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, yeah, yeah you can okay. wrap up. This is a recent work. It's a, definitely a little, a, somewhat of a homage to our COVID uh, uh, related condition. It's called Safe House. And you see it's a locker which is printed with the COVID um, virus. Uh, and using augmented reality, you can open the locker doors and you'll discover inside each locker a human being who is uh, actually exercising. Um, again, because of the slow... But anyway, you just... The exercises are all derived from video games, so they are all... Um, 
video game movements that these people have learnt and which they are um, using, I suppose, to keep themselves sane. And now the last thing I want to talk about, again, talking about embodiment in relation to media art, we've done a lot of uh, projects related to martial arts, and these projects uh, involve motion capture of martial arts masters, and then um, doing visualization, doing a, a sort of aesthetic transformations of the movement of these martial arts masters. I'll just skip and show you here are different types of visualization and uh, I'll show you a few examples as best I can under the conditions. So again, this is all using the, the basic motion capture of the uh, martial arts master and giving different expressions to that. You could say time, space, expressions. So these are different digital visualizations of exactly the same movement. And I'll show you the last one. Ah, it's new. It's a new experience for me too to watch this at this at this frame rate. <laughs> it's like a series of photographs. Okay, that's basically what I wanted to share with you today under the topic. Okay, great. Of, Thank uh, you, Jeffrey. Body socialization yeah. of media art. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I really like how the different projects show how the audience is really playing much more of an active role in kind of engaging with artworks and defining their own kind of experience and exploration of the work. I just have a brief question for Jeffrey. Uh, I mean, I'll, we'll have a more detailed Q&A towards the end. Sure. Uh, but I just want to hear a little bit about, um, you know, the types of spaces or institutions uh, to support this kind of work, because I know ZKM is quite a unique institution to kind of and to support this type of work doesn't necessarily fit in a white cube, traditional white cube gallery, per se. So mm -hmm. what kind of institution or, you know, resources and ways of, you know, spaces do we need to to support and enable this kind of work? Yeah, it's a good question, because uh, um, pretty much the entirety of my art practice has uh, nothing to do with uh, with the gallery system and nothing to do with uh, a um, how do you say a financial um, architecture uh, that is linked to the gallery system so uh, these works are created uh, largely through the um, the benefits of uh, government uh, funding a lot of the early works were funded by the Dutch Arts Council. And then later, um, when I moved into an institutional environment like ZKM in Karlsruhe, and then um, UNSW in Sydney, and then um, CityU and Baptist U here, a lot of the actual work is financed through research grants. Yeah? Uh, some of the work is, is financed through commissions. Uh, commissions to create new works for festivals or for or for exhibitions um, or uh, in some instances as permanent installations so it's um uh, interesting i mean i think it's interesting because it it does demonstrate a, a mode a, a path of uh, of practice and a path of production that uh, is not tied to galleries, is not tied to NFTs, is, is, not, is uh, somewhat um, independent. Yeah? At the same time, it's um, sometimes a bit of a struggle. Okay? Um, 
But each of these works, uh, to some extent, come about because there were circumstances which allowed them to uh, to come into being. Mm -hmm. And I like that, that these artworks are always have to be enacted or they have to be activated with people to engage with it. That's where the work happens. Yeah. So like I'm interested in the idea of like commissions as providing opportunities to stage, you know, these situations so that people can come together and experience a work. And I think, yeah. Yeah, that. I always, I mean, just very simply put, I always thought thinking, you know, being as an artist and starting off doing painting and sculpture myself at one point, I always thought, what a pleasure it is to make art, right? Now, what a disappointment for the viewer just to have to deal with the outcome of that, you know, the end result. Why can't the viewer participate in the process of making? And so these interactive works are in a way co-creations because I set up a certain set of uh, a certain framework, a certain conceptual and aesthetic framework. But from then on, it's the viewer who basically takes control of, of the experience and organizes the work or articulates the work according to their own interests and their own um, way of their own journey. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And I'm sure that will resonate also with Henry's work, who is the next speaker. Uh, you can just swap. Oh, so he will. Debugging the problem with the flag. Okay, so we will swap and we will go with um, Dekai first. Um, so, just to introduce uh, Dekai, so he is a professor of computer science and engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and is distinguished uh, research scholar at Berkeley's International Computer Science Institute. His work in AI, language, music, creativity, and ethics urges cultures to interrelate. For pioneering contributions to machine learning of AIs like Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft Translate, he was honored with the Association for Computational Linguistics as one of 17 founding fellows worldwide, and by Debrett's HK100 as one okay. of the most influential figures in Hong Kong. So here we have Kai, please. Thank you, actually. Um, it's an honor to be here together with Jeffrey and Henry. Um, I'm going to give a perspective uh, from the point of view of a really long time AI researcher. So I've been doing AI research for 35 plus years um, and uh, uh, sort of pioneered uh, um, machine learning approaches to AI instead of good old fashioned AI where you as a human program exactly what's supposed to happen. Um, and the angle I'm going to take from this, I, I look, I tend to look at things from language, from representation, because my area of AI is getting machines to learn human language and music and creativity and so on. Um, we see, we as humans see the world through metaphors. Uh, almost everything we think beyond ouch or I'm hungry, it, we, we couch in terms of metaphors and we do it unconsciously. One of the most central metaphors that we're using unconsciously all the time that we build our perceptions of the world through is that of causality. What is causality? It's a metaphor based on our embodied agency. You know, so first we feel or we think something, we then act uh, using our motor system in some way, typically. We do so expecting some change in the state of the world to happen. And then hopefully we actually witness that change to happen. Um, and this pattern that we experience as embodied beings becomes how we project the workings of the entire universe. We, we, it's like we have this hammer and everything in the universe is a nail that we hit with that hammer. Um, everything is anthropomorphized in terms of agency. It ent enters the syntax of our language. One of the most basic syntactic structures in our language is X did something to Y for Z. Um, and this pattern, um, it's where a lot of religions came from. Our ancestors, you know, uh, saw some inexplicable natural forces um, and anthropomorphized them into the shape of gods. We extended the metaphor to inanimate objects uh, that have no intentionality. So if you say the rock broke the window, um, well, the rock doesn't actually have any intentionality, but we ascribe it uh, through language 
anthropomorphizing the rock. We see the whole universe this way. We see everything in terms of agents causing effects. And the embodied agent becomes a conceptual tool that we use for imagining cause and effect. It's a metaphor we use extensively in the models of mathematical logic, of scientific reasoning. We describe not only nature using this agentive metaphor of causality, but also even man-made machines that are a product of our engineering. Over the centuries, engineers have developed this habit of describing how the machines they design work in terms of the inanimate metaphoric extension of cause and effect. But in the AI era, can we continue to pretend that machines are still inanimate? Can, can we continue to pretend that machines still possess no intentionality? Whether we're talking about good old fashioned AI based on mathematical logic models or modern AI based on machine learning, deep learning, statistical models, all AI operates by pursuing the machine pursuing the intention of achieving a more optimal performance on whatever objective it's been given. And, and we give AIs all kinds of objectives. They can be very narrow AIs, where we give a very narrow objective, for example, of simply being the best at playing chess or Go. Or increasingly, they can be given much more general objectives. For uh, current examples, GPT-3 and the forthcoming GPT-4 deep learning models, which are trained on as much as possible of the world's knowledge already being trained on far more than any human can read in their whole lifetime. And then the trained AI is deployed on a gazillion different tasks that were not anticipated during the training. We're moving rapidly toward the strong AI era where an AI not only has an objective, but it has the objective simply to be the best at everything. It's an era where AIs possess an intentionality far more vast than most humans. And for humans in general, for artists especially, this can be a supremely uncomfortable truth. Because humans, we humans are known for our pride, our tribalism, our jingoism, our sense of superiority. These unconscious cognitive biases are extensively documented through decades of cognitive psychology research. It, and, and that research informs our research, both in our hardcore AI uh, technology research, as well as our work in AI ethics, society, governance, and policy. These unconscious kind of biases are what led humans to place the earth at the center of the universe for so much of our recorded history. And the cultural biases have historically led us to all sorts of mythologies, narratives, and metaphors that make us humans feel safe or secure or superior. This same tendency, which I call human exceptionalism, causes us today to dismiss or reject or overlook uncomfortable realities about AI that we really would prefer not to see. Uncomfortable realities like the following. Is, is the notion that machines should remain our slaves yet another potentially disastrous repetition of our history of master-slave mindset and colonialism? Has this ever, has this mindset ever ended well in history? Second, are we manipulating the machines or are the machines manipulating us? Can we play the first clip, please? A uh, case in point is uh, the freestyle AI. Um, like this freestyling rap that, that improvises responses that. in real time. Everybody trying to look pretty, don't care for the nitty gritty. Heard of in the city, you there, the buster city. Did a 12-year bid on the streets and held it down. On the come here, kid, on the heat, the year, you now. It's a machine that has learned to rap battle by itself. These are the sorts of things that we can really do a lot. So this this um, International Computer Music Conference award-winning work uh, was one in which we built the, the world's first rap battle bot that learned all by itself how to freestyle against you, just simply by going out on the internet and exploring all the rap that's out there. Um, in an era of computational creativity where humans no longer code the rules of what a machine should think, but rather we humans are just coding a, a baby brain 
essentially. And then the baby brain goes on to learn by itself what to do. Who is the artist? Is the artist me, the guy who designed this program, or is it the baby brain that learned to become an artist? This leads me to this, this notion of augmented agency. Whose mind is embodied and by what? Is the mind the humans or the AIs? Is the body the humans or the robots? And these have led us to do all sorts of things, both on the technology and on the artistic side. In, in our musical work in Reorientate, which is my Hong Kong-based tech art world music collective, we blur the boundaries between agency and embodiment. In uh, this example, in the next clip we'll play, two humans side by side uh, use languages of body movement to cause musical sounds, but one, as you'll see in an abstract virtual AI world, and the other in the most raw, primitive world of hands, feet, and the ground. Um, can, we, can we play the second clip, please? body is responsible for creating which act of agency. This is heavily improvisational. The, each of the players are reacting to what the others are doing. Uh, much, it is not uh, heavily rehearsed. And there are idioms going on in the communication between the flamenco dancer uh, and the sounds that are produced both in the virtual world uh, as well as the physical world. So this was kind of a extreme example where I was playing both the flamenco cajon drum and uh, generating virtual uh, sounds in the virtual environment using gestures, body movement. Um, as you know, I, I think this is an area where we need to grapple with the new questions of creativity, of computational creativity. The artistry is coming from a combination of humans and the designer of artificial brains and the artificial brain itself and it's the, the lived experience of the artificial brain and the interactions between them are real time conversations that they are having. But what are the conversations about as as human artists traditionally we think we are using our tools used to be just the brush and uh, the palette, the canvas. But today, we think we're using the machines to tell our human stories. Are we, however, falling victim to the very stories that we like to tell ourselves? What are the stories that the machines are telling? What stories will machine learning AIs be telling themselves as they develop, grow up, and evolve? How will the unconsciously biased stories that we humans, that we human artists are telling today, going to impact upon the stories that drive the AI's intentionalities tomorrow? Um, thanks. Great, right, thank you, Dakai. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's really important to think about, you know, what, um, questioning uh, what is machine intelligence, what constitutes intelligence, and how. Uh, if we think about the ethics behind um, how we train these machines to think, what data are we feeding it? 
and what is the ethical responsibility of the artist to understand that, you know, how intelligent actually are these machines or is it limited by the data that we feed it? And, um, you know, what kind of ideas is it kind of throwing back um, at us about ourselves um, and how that might change the way we, we think about the world. So yeah, thank you, Dakai. Um, so let's uh, move on to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Henry Chu. Uh, so Henry Chu is a designer, programmer, and new media artist in Hong Kong. Uh, so he graduated with a degree in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Auckland and founded the interactive design studio Pill and Pillow in 2004. The studio has won over 150 local and international awards, including Cannes, Lions, Webby, and One Show. His artistic works explore the interaction between body movement and visual music, including his uh, installation displayed here on the ground floor, uh, Blockchain Piano, which takes live data from the crypto market. So please, Henry. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for um, uh, Digital Art Fair to invite me to create work and um, doing this uh, seminar. So uh, I want to be started with uh, a map of like a, when I look back to the work I did in the last 15 to 20 years, um, I was trying to find some pattern. So um, most of my work is through the body. Um, body is the starting point and then through some process and then there will be music. And I realized that if your body is trained for an instrument like you, 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 you uh, learn piano or some music instrument. If you are trained, then um, you, you can play proper music. But I am not a very good music player, but I always have a fantasy to become one. And that's why I, I think this is my area is to explore the possibility of uh, performing music. I would look into the the, the process itself, like, can I create an instrument to help me to perform? Or uh, am I using my body to perform? And at the end, is there only music that I perform? So uh, I'm going to show like 10 of my previous work. And uh, I don't have any conclusion at this point. I just want to show you and maybe you can connect all these dogs together. So uh, the first So this work is called Squiggle. So it's an iPad app. It came out just after a few months after iPad was launched. I had this year, uh, this idea a few years ago like uh, it all, 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 almost all of my work was started with a what if, like what if the line can play it like a string? What if the string can be arranged according to your drawing? So uh, I find it very interesting to blur between behaviors. In this case, by blurring the behavior of try to visualize an object like drawing and playing music. But in this case, I think it's more like uh, creating an instrument rather than performing. But uh, definitely, if you can customize a uh, string instrument that also affect the way you play. So I think it is very interesting to see people to uh, mix up and confuse about their intention of creating. I think that is uh, uh, one of my objectives to do this work. So at some time, I was very fascinated about the pheromone. If you know about pheromone, is like waving your hand in the air, catching invisible notes, and then try to pull the string and then the music. I have a chance to play with pheromone. I have no idea how people can 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 like uh, play um, according to their 
skills because that's like that's like in intangible things you need to play and touch on so um i took that um uh body gesture and i used the um a gyroscope in the device and to make a very um, a digital and mini theremin that you can uh, press to create a sound and then you can move in different orientation to change the pitch and the texture of the sound. Uh, the, the, I also create design this like very toyish interface and um, I think many of my work reminds me like uh, the childhood that I don't have too much toy because I have a very strict family and my father always want to make sure I was studying instead of playing games. So I'm not, maybe a daughter can tell me whether I'm compensating my, my childhood, but uh, I always discovered this side of me. So in this work, I add another layer to the pheromone. So I try to turn the human face into an instrument. And you can interact with the face. And uh, what I was intended to do is uh, you can try to like, a, there's a face here and you poke the different part of the face and you will hear different sound. Like if you poke the eye, you may ouch and you hook the other part it may move and sound differently so this is actually one of the musical instrument in a performance which was directed and created by um, a hong kong uh, new media artist gabriel learn asia so uh, we have this idea to create an instrument for the show and we will um, we are planning to create a dance to play along with this instrument. So this is how it looks like. So we are wearing a hammock and put the iPad and we, um, we, uh, we play the instrument just as we are like poking, poking our own face. So we create this dance to tap and to tilt the, the, the instrument and um, so, uh, that is another work that uh, another aspect of my personal work was trying to get rid of the screen for uh, being an art the digital artist or new media artist we always work with computers and once you have computer that will be screens so we i i came to a lot of exhibition and saw other people's work that's always conformed with like a 16 to 9 rectangular box so i was uh always thinking how to make the screen disappear so how about we change the medium from light to shadow so um that is a word i created um specifically for Dai Gun. The actually is the before the jockey club, Dai Gun was a uh, the prison in the central Hollywood though. So uh, that was the last year the space was opened for exhibition. I was part of this detour. Um, what do you say? Detour is a art program that we have exchanged and traveled to Tokyo. And uh, at the end of the year, they invite some Japanese artists along with some local artists that will travel to Japan and to create a collection of works. So this is my work specific, uh, uh, site specifically for, for the prison. So it is really the prison cell with before all the cleanup you see in Daigo now. And um, I want to use a shadow okay. as my medium. So the logic is very simple. So... I use a sensor. Henry, we're just running Time's a up? little bit short okay. on time, but just okay. if you can wrap up your... Uh, I can wrap like, up. So uh, this is the word. Can I use like three, two minutes to yeah. do 
to just quickly walk through the work. Okay, so sure. this is the work that uh, you play with your shadow. Next. Um, just uh, the, another picture of the work. So this is another work with the shadow, but uh, instead of um, uh, it's the delay of yourself, it is turn the shadow into a sculpture. This is the um, installation I did with a screen with uh, 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 water glasses, and I programmed it. Came around and the out. Without uh, using your finger, but uh, by the movement of the fish. So this is. Uh, in other words, in that turn your body into an instrument. It is an extension from uh, the Newfoundland state. It is the, the, the shadow web plus the squiggle. So it turns your body into a string instrument and then you use your hand to interact with your body. So I get this idea when I play the game, play the game with my daughter. It's a human guitar. So I do this and she was laughing. And uh, this is the name, my name. My name is Julek Han. So the name of this work is called Santai Lekan, that turns your body into my name. <laughs> this work I did uh, as well in one of the show. Uh, that was uh, teaching the computer to take a sketch of your body. And I archive all this image to form a collage. So uh, this is also another work to try to get rid of the screen. It's called Music Puddle. Uh, it's like the kids always like to enjoy jumping in the puddles, but instead of water, they jump into the music. So it is the detection without the screen. Just I use the sensor to um, to to uh, uh, to mark certain area for music interaction. Interaction. This is the work I got commissioned by M Plus. It's called Canto Cocktail. It's not that um, uh, that much of machine learning comparing to the Kai's work, but I pick like hundred songs in Canto pop and then I mix it according to the we mix it according to the uh, chord progression and I use the karaoke interface so uh, this is the introduction of the work and I will skip it uh, this is my work here the channel uh, just play the accord Idea I have 14 years ago. I took the dog chart in Hong Kong and then I turned it into music by simply uh, mapping the highs and low uh, stock price into the high and low keys. So uh, it was, this is the original of the work you are looking at downstairs. So that is. Thank you. So now. Yeah, now we move into the Q&A, so if we can have the, the speakers uh, come back to the stage. So we just have a, a very short q and I just have a brief question uh, for everyone. Um, because I think all of the artworks, there is some element of uh, contingent, something like uncertain that the, the either the audience or the artist um, is responding to. So they're responding either to an AI that's throwing up some unpredictable um, results and there's this dialogue with the, the AI or there's you know some results from the stock market that you know um, that produces unusual aesthetic results that also you know lets us challenges what we think of as art as well and it produces another kind of work. So I just want if uh, we touched a little bit upon this on each of the, the talks, um, but you know, what is the role of the artist? Where, what is the core component of the artwork? Like what is the main artistic aspect in each of the, and maybe give one example or something. And you know, what is the role of the audience and, and who is the author? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything to? Who do you, who do you want yeah, to answer? Yeah, anyone who has something to say, uh, you're welcome to to maybe add add something from your own own work. I mean, for for me, what is interesting is the the systems thinking. 
Uh, I don't think that there is a single artist anymore. Uh, I think that this notion of um, of augmented agency, augmented in intentionality, is for me the key because it it reflects what's actually going on in our society, where opinions today, thoughts, influences in society, are, are already being driven more heavily by the AIs that power social media and recommendation engines and search engines than by most human members of society. And so uh, as a reflection of that dynamic, I think in, in, in the works of art, you have creation that is simultaneously being driven um, intentionally by the human artist, uh, just, you know, for example, in how they construct the, the music or the interactive work. Um, and then at the next layer by the human who constructs the AI, um, who constructs the mind. And then at the next layer by what the AI has learned by itself. And what's interesting is the dialogue between those and how they shape each other. Um, that's just my quick answer. I, and I think that that is an accurate reflection of what's happening in our society. Mm -hmm. So it is this dynamic process, this back and forth, and that the artwork is actually changing constantly as we're responding back and forth between the machine learning and ourselves. Jeffrey, do you have anything to add? I think just in, in the most general sense, I think that uh, an artist has the freedom, right, to, uh, you could say, mix and match, to basically put whatever ingredients they want to put into the artwork and um and so a painter makes certain choices and a sculptor makes certain choices and today we have a whole range of choices and uh, we can define for instance what our relationship is to the viewer uh, we can define whether the work is uh, absolute or whether it is able to transform itself we can define what external factors might influence the work. Indeed, we can bring AI, machine learning, blockchain. We can basically bring whatever elements we want together uh, to constitute what we will call an artwork and what we may call a new artwork. And um, and then the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Because finally, there is something that we produce as a consequence of all these uh, bringing of things together. And uh, that outcome is what becomes uh, a high or a low in art history, <laughs> or somewhere in between. And Henry? Um... Uh, I think as an artist, I always challenge myself to to find another the next thing to break and the next rule to break. I think by breaking rules, like keep like asking the question, why not? Like why I have to be the artist? Why I have to set the rules? Can the rules be set by the computer? Can the can the uh, can the viewer can be uh, can the viewer be the creator as well? So um, by uh, changing the circumstances of the uh, like the, the creator and the receiver that I think that open another set of possibilities. I think technology is very special, like it definitely accelerating this process and we, we see new possibility every day. So I think um, that's why I love to use technology as my medium and um, because I just get bored very easily. <laughs> I, I have yeah. one more thought on this. Sure. Uh, in AI today, uh, one of the thing emerging things that we're seeing, uh, and it's again going to develop extremely quickly, as we've been seeing, is that today AIs are already the, um, beginning to design other AIs. And so now the question is, uh, an AI that has been designed by another AI, that has been designed by another AI, when they create something, who is the artist? Yeah, and I think that's uh, an 
with a lot of these works, it's like, where does the art lie? It's no longer material, but like also how do we attribute, you know, authorship? So in that regards, like what happens to the art market? Like how do we sell works? Does, or does the market, is the market catching up to this, this new form of art? I'm just wondering, like, um, if you see that, that the, you know, with blockchain technologies, if that is gonna catch up and find other ways of monetizing other kinds of work <laughs> that maybe, yeah, where the authorship is blurry. I mean, the art market relies on authorship. That is kind of one of the central components of, you know, how you buy and sell and attribute value to works. So. I mean, blockchain is one of the good things about blockchain and related technologies is being able to trace uh, at a very fine level the, the contributions. Uh, to new ideas, right? This is something we didn't have uh, through most of human history because you, it was just lost in the mists of history who influenced who. Uh, and with a ledger system, uh, you can actually track um, that. And so I think we may be moving to an era where the authorship uh, is much more decentralized and there is an attribution chain. And as a, you know, the artist side of me actually likes that. Yes, there is a part of all of us that says, I made this. <laughs> and I want to, but even the to audience for making this, right? Can but, we say that an audience also that, is an author absolutely, of it? And they absolutely. also can maybe get some revenue from when that artwork sells, for instance? I mean, I think it's actually a great thing if you can credit all of the artists that came before uh, you and that influenced you. Um, that's the best homage that you could pay. Uh, so, so perhaps that's a good thing. So in that way, um, art no longer belongs to the artists. It's also, you know, the audiences and the technologies as well who also contribute to making the work. So I believe we are times up. Um, so I apologize that we didn't get to go to the audience uh, questions, Q&A. But I just want to say thank you very much to all of our speakers. It was really ex exciting conversation with all of you. So thanks again, and I hope uh, everyone enjoys the rest of the fair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.